Well, thank you, David, for that uh, very generous introduction, and thank you all for coming today. I, I appreciate the chance to talk to you today about the research that I'm doing in this area in dealing with Australia's anti-terror laws, and in doing so, I want to acknowledge uh, people in the audience who I'm working with on this topic, and indeed, one of the great virtues of having a Laureate Fellowship is it's not just me working on these issues, but in fact, a team of around 12 people including a number of PhD students, postdoctoral students and other academics. And I certainly want to acknowledge that I have benefited enormously from talking with them about these issues. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is Australia's turbulent 10 years of enacting anti-terror laws. And what I should say at the outset is uh, that 10 years has come as a complete surprise to me. Uh, I didn't expect to be spending the best part of a decade working on anti-terror laws. In fact, uh, I did as an undergraduate write an honours thesis on the Communist Party case and on issues about suppressing uh, communism in Australia and issues not too distant from terrorism. But I wrote that as an undergra undergraduate thinking that that type of study would be purely of academic interest, that surely Australia would never again be in the space where we would enact laws uh, dealing with communism or dealing with terrorism, the laws which go to some of the big questions of our time around civil liberties and laws which raise really fundamental questions about our legal system and how we deal with questions such as how to protect the community. So it's a 10 years I didn't expect and it's a 10 years that uh, has been remarkably busy in part because the government has enacted, indeed the parliament has enacted so many laws over that period. Now the anti-terror laws we got were very much enacted as a reaction to what occurred on September 11 and also subsequent attacks including in Bali and most recently in Delhi. And those laws, when they were cast, were, as you'd expect, were cast as an exceptional response. They were an emergency reaction to those events occurring overseas. And they were passed because it was said, not only did we need to do our bit to prevent terrorism overseas, but we also needed to take steps to prevent that form of indiscriminate violence occurring at home. What's now clear, 10 years later, is that those short-term, transient laws have achieved a character of permanence within Australia. We've got laws in our books that uh, were only meant to be there for that short period, but at this point it's clear they're here to stay. And that in part reflects the government's own assessment of the fact that terrorism is a persistent threat to Australia. We have our national counter-terrorism alert system which tells us just how likely a terrorist attack is. And now for many years it's been at the level of medium in describing the current level of threat. Now at least they've updated what medium means. Some years ago, if you looked at the website to determine what a medium threat was, it told you very helpfully that there was a medium risk of a terrorist attack. Now that's been changed and we now know that that means that a terrorist attack could occur. No more than that. But if you look at the government's other documents, such as its recent white paper, it said in 2010, the threat of terrorism to Australia is real and enduring. It has become a persistent and permanent feature of Australia's security environment. So a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment, and indeed what this paper is addressed to, is how do we deal with this problem of law that exceptional laws have been passed for an exceptional time, yet those laws have become a permanent feature of the legal landscape? How do you deal with the problem that Australia has warlike powers that normally previously only would have been passed during World War I and World War II, yet these powers are on the statute book now for an indefinite period? and indeed have been there for a longer period than like laws during those wars, if you compare the length of the current war on terror with those earlier world conflicts. What's clear is that uh, what's happening today is that as a result of these laws being passed and achieving a character of permanence, we're seeing within the Australian legal system a range of new precedents emerging for what represents an appropriate use of government power. Indeed, if you talk to parliamentarians or agencies like ASIO, they have a clear understanding that what was perhaps unthinkable prior to September 11 is now within the realm of the achievable by virtue of the laws that are still on the books. We're also seeing changed understandings of how the law should work when it comes to the rights of accused or the role of government, and new expectations and indeed political conventions when it comes to what we as a community expect from legislators when it comes to a threat such as terrorism. Overall, what we're seeing in Australia is the exceptional becoming normal. And as a result, the laws that I'm going to talk to are being copied in other aspects of our legal system when it comes to issues such as bail or even the debate over bikey laws in Australia where we've seen the control order regime developed for terrorists being applied in South Australia, Queensland and New South Wales. And indeed in South Australia, the Premier there went so far as to say that bikies are their terrorists 
and it's entirely appropriate to copy anti-terror copy anti-terror measures when dealing with bikies within their community. What I'm going to do today in this lecture is really describe two things. The first thing is I want to actually catalogue and describe what's happened. So much has happened so quickly, even though it's only been for a decade, that in fact nobody has really got a clear sense of what's been done when it comes to the making of anti-terror laws in Australia. Before this paper I only had a sense developed from the writing of many submissions and the fact that it's been a busy time, but I'm going to give you a more concrete sense. And secondly, with the perspective of a decade, I want to draw some lessons. What can we learn from this 10 year period? And in particular, what can we learn for the future when it comes to the presence of these anti-terror laws in our books? Well, turning then to the first topic, uh, describing what's happened. If we turn to September 11, 2001, at that point, Australia had no national laws directed specifically to terrorism on our statute book. In fact, the only law we had that even mentioned terrorism was in the Northern Territory, and nobody's quite sure why the Northern Territory had that law, but it was the only one then on the books. After September 11, we adopted a response that was very similar to other Western nations. What we did was pass a very large number of laws, and laws that sought to deviate from the ordinary criminal law in setting down a range of new unthinkable sanctions and processes and powers that were put in place to deal with terrorism. And indeed, in the case of Australia, it led to a quite extraordinary bout of lawmaking and the building of a set of laws in a short period of time that is unparalleled in Australia's legislative history. In fact, there has never been such a sustained burst of lawmaking on any topic in a history as there has been on anti-terror laws over the last decade. If you look to the number of the laws, uh, over that decade long period, the, just the Federal Parliament has enacted 54 separate anti-terror statutes, themselves running to hundreds, thousands of pages across the statute book. Most of these, in fact almost all of them, were passed during the Howard Government up until the end of 2007. 48 of the 54 were passed during that period. And uh, that reflects the fact that a new anti-terror statute was passed in Australia during that period roughly every seven weeks. And that gives you a very clear indication of the attention and energy put to this issue. If you think how often the Federal Parliament passes law on any particular topic, even something like tax, it just doesn't compare to a statute every seven weeks from 2001 to 2007 on the topic of anti-terrorism. Since 2007, the pace has declined and we've since had six anti-terror statutes under the Rudd and Gillard governments some significant statutes I'll turn to, but nonetheless a much slower pace of making anti-terror laws. This compares unfavourably, in my view, with the number of laws passed by other comparable countries. In fact, in speaking at conferences around the world on this topic of anti-terror laws, one thing I'm always asked is, why has Australia passed so many laws on terrorism? And this might come from an American, a Canadian or a New Zealander, they just can't understand, given the level of threat here, why we've passed so many laws compared to those other countries. Kent Roach, uh, a Canadian scholar, one of the leading world scholars on anti-terror laws, has described Australia's response as being hyper-legislation. Hyper uh, he said Australia has exceeded the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada in the sheer number of new anti-terror laws that it has enacted since 9-11. The degree of legislative activism is striking compared even to the United Kingdom's active agenda and is much greater than the pace of legislation in the United States and Canada. Of course, the numbers only tell a, a very small part of the story and what's remarkable about the Australian laws is not just their number but their reach and the fact that in very significant respects they go beyond what you will find in even a country like the United States. Uh, I think it demonstrates very clearly that in Australia, more so even than many other countries, the laws we have are very much calibrated to the fear that was felt as a result of terrorism and much less calibrated to the actual threat that we were facing in this country. <coughs> to give you a sense then of what the laws actually do, a panoramic perspective of what we've got on our statute book, the first thing the laws do is they actually define what a terrorist act is. And that remains one of the most enduring problems and difficulties with anti-terror laws around the Western world. The laws fix upon the fact that you commit an act which might harm an electronic installation, damage property or injure individuals, and you do that act for a political, religious or ideological cause. And you do it in a way that's designed to intimidate or coerce the government or a section of the public. 
The most controversial aspect of that is it positively labels an act terrorism because of its religious element or its ideological element or because of its political element. And that's a very unusual part of our law in fixing upon an issue of motive or why an act was committed as opposed to leaving that out of the agenda. And of course, if you think about that definition, it's very broad. There's no exception there for a freedom fighter. And indeed, there's no doubt that Nelson Mandela is a terrorist under Australia's anti-terror laws. <coughs> he was called a terrorist by Margaret Thatcher, and indeed he undertook an at times violent campaign against the apartheid regime in South Africa. And Australia's definition does extend internationally, just as it does domestically. Uh, the definition that we've got elsewhere has caused a number of problems. In the United Kingdom, for example, prosecutions were brought with regard some years ago to people in Libya seeking to depose Colonel Gaddafi on the basis that they are undoubtedly terrorists under these type of definitions. Uh, those prosecutions have become somewhat embarrassing in light of recent events in Libya, but there's still no doubt that the rebels in Libya are terrorists under our definition. Uh, they are people engaged in a political or religious or ideological cause and they're doing so in a way that is injuring people and they're doing so in a way that is very clearly designed to intimidate, coerce or even displace a government. The second thing the laws do is set down a range of offences relating to terrorism. Of course there's a new offence of committing a terrorist act but the real work of the offences is done with regard to preparation for a terrorist attack. And the bulk of the offences go to things such as receiving training with respect to terrorism, or providing documents or handling documents, or my own favourite is possessing a thing connected with terrorism, with thing not actually defined in any way in the legislation. <coughs> and these are offences including the preparation offences where penalties of up to life imprisonment result. We have a prescription regime where the Commonwealth can ban organisations on the decision of the Commonwealth Attorney General, not a court, and individuals connected with those organisations can be jailed for lengthy periods, including not just members of an organisation, but informal members of an organisation. Again, a non-defined term, but it's clear that you don't need to be a member, but you might just be associated in some way, and you can lead uh, to yourself being jailed. We have uh, financing offences, uh, and they include life penalties for things such as collecting funds, for uh, terrorist organisations <coughs> and we have a series of offences relating to speech and acts that uh, seek to stop what people say. <coughs> You'd be well aware I suspect with the sedition offences in Australia which originally imposed a seven year jail term based upon the urging of violence in certain respects and that seven years resulted not from any action but merely from your words. We've also got as part of these speech, speech offences a new classification rules whereby books, films and the like can be banned or censored because they advocate the doing of a terrorist act. But the advocating is very broadly defined. It includes any book uh, that actually praises terrorism, including Nelson Mandela or any of the things I've talked about, in a way that leads to a risk that any person, regardless of their age or mental impairment, might decide thereby to engage in a terrorist act. And that's a remarkable provision given as lawyers we're used to the law but working around a reasonable person who would do this or that. This provision lets books and other things be censored on the basis of how a person with a mental impairment might relate to that book or other thing. And uh, the act, less there's any doubting, goes on to say mental impairment includes severe psychoses and a range of afflictions. And you can imagine how difficult that is to comply with. How do you determine whether your book might lead someone with a serious mental illness to commit a terrorist act when by its nature it involves a level of illness and irrationality? We've also got further means by which organisations can be banned for advocating or praising terrorists. Indeed, some years ago there was the real prospect that the Australian National University could have been banned as a terrorist organisation. It gave an honorary degree to Nelson Mandela and in doing so praised him widely for his fight against apartheid. What that type of provision shows is that the problem here is one of overbreadth throughout these laws and indeed it relies upon a wise and sensible application of the laws the laws themselves are not well tailored to their precise circumstances and they only work if the officials, the government, the attorney, the police officers actually make wise decisions about how to apply them. That itself is a major rule of law problem because it means that you have to make assumptions or hope uh, 
that the laws will be applied in a way that doesn't actually affect you, even though it would seem that you are covered by their terms. We've also got a range of new coercive powers for police and security organisations. Uh, police federally have a doubled investigation period for terrorism suspects from 12 to 24 hours. And not only that, uh, they have a concept called dead time, whereby you can question a terrorist suspect for 24 hours, but you can stop the questioning for lengthy periods. Initially, you could stop the questioning indefinitely, so you could hold a person indefinitely, so long as you never reached your 24-hour questioning period. And indeed, that's how Dr Hanif was held for 12 days, on the basis there was no cap on that dead time. It's now being capped at seven days. But uh, that's still seven days that a terrorism suspect can be held without charge. The most contentious of these coercive powers is that of ASIO, which is able to have non-suspects, such as journalists, family members or the like, held for questioning and actually detained for a period of up to one week not on the basis they were involved in terrorism, but on the basis they might know something about someone else involved in terrorism. If that person refuses to answer questions, uh, say about a family member, they can be jailed for five years. And if a journalist reports on their detention, including their misuse within detention, the journalist can be jailed for five years under this regime. We've also got now warrantless searches, whereby uh, the police can enter a person's private property without a warrant, in order to search for things connected with terrorism in, in limited circumstances. We've got control orders which enable house arrest of up to a year, preventative detention whereby people can be held without charge for 14 days under a different regime. We've got uh, surveillance measures whereby telecommunications warrants invo involving tracking devices, optical surveillance and otherwise can be used against not just suspects but any person likely to communicate with a suspect, so particularly their lawyers are covered by that. And it's one regime that it can, can apply surveillance to lawyers, even the priest in the confession box. Again, it just depends on the discretion being widely used, but you wouldn't know that you were subject to surveillance in any event. We've got new rules for evidence. The National Security Information Act enables courts to be closed down to public view and indeed the possibility that uh, people may be convicted on evidence they do not get to see. And a judge must give, in making decisions about what an accused can and can't see, the greatest weight to national security over their right to a fair trial. So it expressly skews the trial towards national security and away from a fair trial. And finally, I mentioned that there's a range of areas dealing with things like security protocols or arrest powers for customs officers, and there's a range of border and transport security. Now what I've sought to do there is actually just really touch the, the tip of the iceberg to give you a sense of the breadth of these laws. And in doing so, to give you a sense of how they retain a range of extraordinary features not previously found in the law, to give agencies, governments and the like uh, quite stark powers in this respect. The laws themselves, particularly the powers that go to prosecutions, have been extensively used. 37 men have been charged under Australia's anti-terror laws. The Attorney General uses a figure of 38, but that's only because he includes David Hicks. Uh, I'm not including David Hicks. I don't think he was ever properly charged with a terrorism offence, so hence I come with the figure of 37. 23 of these men have been convicted, and they have been convicted often of very lengthy sentences. Uh, as I've said, life imprisonment is often possible, and over 20 year sentences are very common in this area. Not one of these men have ever been convicted of carrying out a terrorist attack. They've all been convicted of offences relating to preparing for a terrorist attack. And in this respect, the laws go far further than the ordinary criminal law. The normal inchoate offences of attempting or the like are extended by the fact that the law says you don't actually need to have a plan and you don't actually need to have any real intention to carry out any plan. It's simply enough that you undertake any acts that prepare for what may or may not in the future turn out to be an act of terrorism. In one trial, for example, in Sydney, a Justice Wheelie in sentencing five men noted the fact that they hadn't reached any conclusion as to the nature of the attack. They had not reached any decision to harm anyone. They did not have any plan. Yet under the laws, it was regarded as a very serious offence and they were all jailed for over 20 year periods. And interestingly, what's happening in that case, as we're seeing elsewhere, is instead of even fixing upon specific things like possessing a thing, people are normally now being charged with the catch-all offence of conspiracy to do an act in preparation for a terrorist attack. Uh, 
And if you think of those elements, conspiracy by nature broad, preparation by nature broad without the need for any firm plan, it shows just how broad these offences are. In fact, they are quite extraordinary when looked at in the light of Australia's criminal law. And uh, when you combine those with up to life imprisonment, you can see why uh, we're seeing a large number of prosecutions and some very heavy offences given out. What I want to do now, having looked in the first part of my lecture at what's happened and, and a brief overview of the trials, is to draw the lessons that, that I would take from this experience over the last decade. And uh, in doing so, uh, really this is based upon my own developing theory, thinking over that decade. And in some respects, I'd acknowledge that my thinking has often changed quite substantially as uh, I've re-evaluated my positions in light of what's happened. And part of this re-evaluation is because of where I started. The fact that these laws aren't just transient laws, they are now pretty much permanent, it seems, and that must change our assessment of the laws and their appropriateness for our legal system. That said, the first of the four lessons that I draw out is that my view, and it has always been my view, is that Australia does need laws on our national statute book directed to the prevention of terrorism. The fact that we had no laws prior to September 11 is not surprising. Australia has no long history of terrorism. In fact, we only have a few isolated inc incidents, such as the 1978 Hilton bombing. But uh, my view is the fact that attacks were rare in Australia prior to September 11 is not a justification for a lack of law. In fact, ideally, terrorism, terrorism laws must be in place prior to an attack. Usually the worst possible time to make anti-terror laws is after an attack. If nothing else, the worst possible time to work out just how far such laws should go is when people are feeling rage, grief, and a range of other emotions because of a catastrophic loss of life. Making anti-terror laws after the event almost guarantees the absence of a rational, effective debate as to their scope. With that in mind, it would have been far preferable to Australia to have laws on the books prior to an attack, and equally to be thinking about such laws now when we don't have over us the shadow at least of a recent attack. It has been argued very forcefully by a number of people, including eminent criminal lawyers, that Australia didn't need new laws because we had extensive criminal laws already on the books. After all, terrorism is an act of murder, it's an act of assault, in fact, you can throw the criminal law book at terrorists for the actions that they undertake. My own view is, though, is that that position is not sustainable and that the criminal law as it existed in 2001 was not in an adequate form for combating terrorism. Partly this is because I accept the fact that the threat of terrorism is real domestically and internationally, but more generally because I think there are just gaps in the law when it comes to specific problems of terrorism. <coughs> For example, we didn't have offences dealing adequately with the financing of terrorism. And one of the things that clearly needs to be done is to have offences to stop the flow of money to people willing to carry out a terrorist attack. And even if we don't think the threat is high here, that's clearly, I think, a requirement to stop the flow of money overseas. More broadly, though, the criminal law in place in 2001 was directed not primarily to the problem of prevention of these acts, but the bringing of a perpetrator to justice after the event. And given the potential for a catastrophic loss of life when it comes to terrorism, I think there's an added justification for offences that go to prevention when it comes to anti-terror law. Indeed, I think there's a necessity for laws going to prevention. It's partly a matter of political pragmatism to recognise that preventative laws are required, but also I think it's about respecting and protecting fundamental human rights and properly conceived anti-terror laws should be seen as laws which go towards the prevention of attacks in order to preserve the right to life and also our freedom to live lives free of fear. That said, uh, big questions arise as to just how early anti-terror laws should intervene in the criminal chain of causation. And indeed, I think there are very persuasive arguments that laws don't get that balance correct at the moment. That said, I don't think they're an argument against anti-terror laws, but for their recalibration to ensure that they operate more appropriately than they do at the moment. <coughs> I think it's also true that we needed anti-terror laws to deal with the powers that our agencies needed to prevent terrorist attacks. And in particular, we lacked laws going especially to the problem of groups or cells of terrorists. 
Well, act laws that actually dealt with the group aspect of terrorism and agencies needed powers to disrupt those groups and to do so in ways that the existing law did not then provide. This again is an issue of proportionality and in my view any of these powers uh, must be subject to strict and transparent safeguards enforced by independent agencies and there are significant problems in that respect. I think also there's arguments that Australia was justified in enacting new laws because of our obligations internationally. Resolution 1373 charged Australia and other nations in the aftermath of the September 11 attacks to take the necessary steps to prevent the commission of terrorist acts by ensuring that terrorist acts are established as serious criminal offences in domestic laws and regulations. And even though we had many criminal laws, we had very few going to the problem of prevention as opposed to other matters. Finally, I think that these laws were justified, or at least a form of laws were justified, because of their moral dimension. I think in an era punctuated by the loss of life in the attacks in New York and Washington through to places like Bali, Mumbai and Delhi, it was appropriate that Australia reacted by enacting a specific crime of terrorism that made it clear that we reject the use of violence. Uh, including in a political or ideological or religious name. Given that lesson, my view is that uh, Australian governments and parliaments deserve credit for recognising the need for anti-terror laws. And in fact, the absence of such laws prior to September 11 reflects a level of complacency on our part about the potential for violence, political violence, here and overseas. <coughs> the second lesson I draw from the laws is that Inferior laws result from, from poor, poor processes of enactment and review. Australia needed a regime of anti-terror law, but often we didn't need the laws we actually got. And in, the, in part, this reflects the fact that the laws we actually got were made through a very poor process of enactment. The first set of anti-terror laws set a very bad precedent in this respect. In the aftermath of September 11, we had laws introduced into the House of Representatives on 12 March 2002, dealing with major issues such as the banning of organisation and the criminalisation of terrorism, and they were forced through the House of Representatives the next day. <coughs> the laws demonstrate a common theme that applied at least until the end of the Howard government, and that is that people sponsoring new anti-terror measures sought to see them passed by Parliament as quickly as possible and with as little scrutiny as possible. In fact, uh, in particular, after the Howard government gained power in the Senate after the 2004 election, there was an almost complete disregard for parliamentary processes and a willingness to ride roughshod over parliamentary process to get laws passed in record time. The best example of this, and there are many, was the law introduced into Parliament in 2005 after the London bombings. <coughs> that law was introduced into Parliament on 3 November 2005 and Attorney General Philip Ruddock said that the law had to be passed by Christmas. It was a law dealing with control orders, sedition, preventative detention and indeed a host of the most contentious aspects of our anti-terror laws. The government with power in both chambers forced the legislation through it had a very short inquiry by a Senate committee, which gave people like myself who wanted to analyse and make a submission on this enormous bill only six days to do so. In the end, the legislation was passed on 7 December, just over a month later, in plenty of time for Christmas. One of the consequences, though, of the law was that even at the point of its enactment, it was widely recognised, including by members of the government, that the law was flawed. Uh, the best example of that was the new sedition offence, and what the government did was instead of delaying enactment to get the sedition offence correct, was they agreed upon enactment they would refer the sedition offence to the Australian Law Reform Commission so that it could help them or advise on proper drafting of the offence with a view to repairing what had just been enacted. It meant we had this process of backwards lawmaking. Make the law first, then refer it to an inquiry to determine what form the law should take while a flawed law all the while remains on the statute book containing seven-year jail terms for speech. The Law Reform Commission reported in July 2006, in a very short time frame, it recommended extensive amendment due to major flaws and problems, including the absence of defences for things like academic conduct or even comedy, but there was no desire to implement those changes. And uh, the Howard government made no move to fix its own law, 
And even with the change of government in 2007, nothing happened until five years later when finally the Commission's recommendations were implemented in 2010. Uh, that's a, a normal part of lawmaking in this respect. Make a law that's often seen to be problematic, send it to an inquiry, don't implement the findings until perhaps many years down the track. Uh, there are a number of laws that fit into this category, including the Hanif law that gave rise to so many problems involving the indefinite potential period of detention without charge. Some of these problems with regard to lawmaking could be fixed if we actually had effective processes of review, and the Law Reform Commission is an example of an effective process of review, but instead what we've seen has been patchy and inconsistent when it comes to review of the laws. We've had major assessments of the laws, but even where those assessments have been effective, governments have not in the main been willing to implement the findings. In fact, none of the findings of these major reviews, bar some dealing with the ASIO powers, were implemented at all until 2010. And it meant that for the most of this decade, we've had laws known to be flawed uh, that have been allowed to stay on the books. And by flawed, not just in terms of their impact upon civil liberties, but where inquiries have found the laws could not give rise to effective prosecutions because prosecuting authorities would not be able to use the laws given their incoherence. Even where in 2010 the Rudd Gellard government legislated to actually implement many of the findings of the reviews, they did so on a selective basis. They ignored many of the findings that would have introduced effective safeguards. And they also took the laws further by introducing warrantless searches. So it was a very mixed package when it came to actually doing anything in this respect. It's also fair to say that even, there, even though there have been major reviews, uh, most of the laws just haven't been reviewed at all. In fact, the most contentious aspects, in many respects, have never been assessed. Things like the control order regime, preventative detention, have never been subject of any form of post-enactment review. And that's despite the fact there have been very clear promises to do exactly that. <coughs> For example, just after the Howard government had passed the control order regime, amongst those other London bombing changes, the Council of Australian Government said in February 2006 that there will be a committee of review which will commence in 2010. December 2010 to review these mechanisms, uh, that committee has never been established. And uh, it's an example of how promises are made to review. Indeed, those promises are often part of the price of enactment, yet those promises are not followed up upon. What we do have in what is one of the rare positive developments in this regard is the establishment of an independent national security legislation monitor. That was passed last year, and in April 2011, the post was filled by Sydney barrister Brett Walker. He has undoubted capacity to do this job well in providing oversight across the anti-terror laws, but unfortunately the post was not filled for over a year, and it's not clear that there will be a political willingness to actually follow up on whatever sensible recommendations he has. Overall, the problem in this area demonstrates, if nothing else, that we have seen a real political reluctance to revisit anti-terror laws once enacted, and that laws enacted usually often in undue haste have been reviewed rarely and repaired sometimes or most often not at all. The third lesson about the anti-terror laws is that the lack of human rights safeguards in Australia has, a major, has had a major impact in enabling the enactment of disproportionate laws. And in fact, in this respect, Australia law, Australia's laws, I think, are calibrated much more, as I've said, to the level of fear people have felt and less so to the level of threat that we've actually faced. It's not surprising that at a time of anger, fear and grief that politicians are forced to respond by acting with regard to new laws. In these circumstances, human rights standards play a really valuable role. They provide a yardstick that actually forces us to remember values within our democracy that we should only depart from in, at our peril. This actually can provide some, if I would recognise limited use, when politicians say they must enact tough laws and do whatever it takes to stop a future terrorist attack. <coughs> indeed, a more significant benefit of human rights protection is not even at the time of the enactment of laws, but that they provide a trigger and mechanism for the reassessment of the laws after the event. The experience of the United States, Canada and the like shows that in the face of something as catastrophic as September 11, we need to be realistic about just how effective legal sanctions about human rights will be in blunting the excesses of the laws. 
But what's equally clear after the event is that those same protections can be immensely helpful in providing a reassessment at a more rational moment in our public life about the appropriateness of those laws. In the United Kingdom, for example, the Cameron government, elected in 2010, has engaged in a major reassessment of its laws. It's actually got in Parliament a Protection of Liberties Bill, which is designed to reassess, recast things like control orders, to actually bring them into line more appropriately with the democratic sanctions and safeguards within that system. What's important for us is we copied their control order regime. The UK at the moment has legislation that would abolish that regime and actually replace it with something far less intrusive, yet there's no domestic debate in Australia about responding even to the fact that we'll be left with a regime that is regarded as discredited in the country that first adopted it. Not only that, we adopted their regime without even adopting their safeguards. And indeed, there are a number of court cases in the United Kingdom which have been very important in limiting the use of their control orders that would be impossible in Australia because of the absence of Human Rights Act or Bill of Rights. What this means is that uh, Australia is actually alone in the democratic world in not having any domestic reference point at the national level for the human rights that we ought to consider in enacting anti-terror laws. We have a system whereby the role of judges is at the best at the margins of the debate and legislators have nothing on the books that they must consider in enacting these laws. <coughs> and this has a really dramatic impact upon how the laws are made and on the final form of the laws. When it comes to the making of the laws, I remember, for example, appearing before a Senate inquiry where a group before me, the International Commission of Jurists, was giving evidence about international human rights standards and how they should impact on ASIO's new powers. That evidence was not received well. Uh, I remember it was actually Kim Beasley who said in that committee, can you give us something we can actually use? We need something Australian that is relevant to making this decision. They weren't able to provide that. There wasn't the international implement the implementation of these domestically and their evidence was actually ended early on the basis that international human rights standards are not appropriate for actually casting these laws. I followed, ditched all my human rights material and went simply for the separation of powers and things that fit within the Australian legal system and we extensively used ultimately in the committee's report. But of course the separation of powers are very limited use in this context. They don't provide things like freedom from arbitrary detention, they don't provide clear protections for freedom of speech and uh, on that and many other occasions the absence of human rights has been telling. One result is that we do actually have laws on our books that would be unthinkable if not constitutionally impossible in other countries. No other nation has anything like Australia's attempt to enact a sedition law. And no other democratic nation has anything like the ASIO power that enables non-suspect citizens to be detained for intelligence gathering purposes. In fact, this is one of those provisions, the ASIO provision, where internationally people keep saying, can you tell us exactly what it does? It just doesn't make any sense. Surely you couldn't have that in a country like Australia. You couldn't have conceived of anything like that even in the context of making the Patriot Act in the United States. More broadly, we have a range of powers that just don't have the same safeguards as you find in other countries. What this shows is in Australia that we, uniquely in the democratic world, don't have legal protections around human rights in this respect. But when we ask what are the checks and balances, the safeguards when it comes to the making of our anti-terror laws, the key and often only safeguard is that we must rely upon the good judgment and self-restraint of our legislators. When that goes missing, as it often does, particularly after an attack, we're simply left with a capacity for Parliament to enact whatever laws it wishes in response to the community's demand to do whatever it takes in meeting the threat of terrorism. Suffice it to say, uh, I don't think this has proved to be a check and balance that's been effective in Australia in the making of these laws. <coughs> the fourth and final lesson is that even though I believe anti-terror law has a role to play in protecting the community, it's clear that these laws come with significant costs. In particular, these laws do and have given rise to grievance in sections of the community where they feel that members have been unfairly picked upon singled out or ostracised. This sense of grievance has been magnified by the exceptional nature of the laws and what has often been a heavy-handed government and media response to their use against people in the community. It's also been a problem because the laws have the appearance of being selectively used when applied in the community, 
If nothing else, it's significant that of the 19 anti-terror organisations currently banned in Australia, 18 of those 19 have links to Muslim or Islamic ideologies. In doing so, they give the perception that those ideologies represent almost completely the only problem when it comes to terrorism. And that representation, that they represent uh, around 95% of the groups connected with terrorism, is simply fundamentally out of kilter with the reality of terrorism internationally. The problem here is that these costs in, pr in producing what can be strong extreme reactions to the laws themselves is actually what terrorism seeks to achieve. Terrorism can't win through military might. It relies upon democratic states overreacting in how they respond to terrorism in a way that actually radicalises sections of their own community. Terrorism as a strategy relies upon Australia taking action that assists in the recruitment of terrorists such as by people feeling so angry about the laws or what's been done or the invasion of Iraq that they're willing to undertake actions that were unthinkable for them prior to that occurrence. The laws also rely critically upon communities cooperating with agencies like the police and with agencies like ASIO. If people feel angry about the laws or they feel as if they've been singled out, they're far less likely to engage in what is a really vital community intelligence operation. Now these problems can be met or minimised uh, by having fair laws that operate not selectively but appropriately across the community. But even then there's certainly a risk still that it will lead to a strong community counter reaction. And that means that the laws themselves can on occasion become part of the problem and not the solution. They can actually contribute to radicalisation and the growth of domestic extremism. And this has been especially recognised in the United Kingdom where their problems of homegrown terrorism are seen as very much a reaction not just to particular ideological causes but to the actions of their laws in their governments in things like the invasion of Iraq or in things such as what can be even there their heavy-handed anti-terror laws. This gives rise to a need that anti-terror laws must be matched by a broader range of community strategies if they're to be effective. And here unfortunately federal governments have come relatively late to the realisation that the laws themselves cannot do all of the work. It was only in 2010 in the Counterterrorism White Paper that we saw a specific development of a domestic violent extremism policy and money in the budget of that year for developing those programs. It's only the beginning of what's needed and it needs to be part of a broader social inclusion agenda which governments have had but have not adequately put to the tackling of terrorism. Well, in conclusion, uh, my view as I've expressed it in this paper is uh, looking back after 10 years in the wake of September 11, uh, I think Australia did need and does need anti-terror laws on our statute book. Unfortunately, the laws we've got diverge in too many respects from the laws that we should have achieved over that decade. Not only that, the laws expose fundamental structural problems within the Australian legal system. It shows just how clear, just it shows very clearly how that system is dependent for good laws upon effective parliamentary processes and a continuing culture of respect among political leaders when it comes to vital democratic values, rule of law principles and human rights. Anti-terror laws show how many of these bedrock principles are just in fact only assumptions or conventions within our political system and they are not in fact hard rules that demand compliance when it comes to the making of extraordinary statutes. The laws also reveal the capacity and of our politicians and parliaments to readily contravene these assumptions and conventions where political interest suits that to occur or indeed where the community demand is strong enough. My own view is that the anti-terror laws, as much as we need some laws, do as a body reveal great weaknesses in our system of government, weaknesses in our political leadership and most fundamentally the fragile status of important values within our democracy. Thank you.